to achieve the ABC certificate in Boston University, except for Bob Clark. Really, I should have said that. Yes, I really do have some questions. Very good. Now, my question is for you. <laughs> oh, I thought you said Bob. <laughs> Uh, and so, you know, part of, particularly when you have something as practical as living in peace with folks, how does holiness relate to that? How does holiness relate to the rest of this passage? And so that's kind of what I'm shooting at today. Hopefully we'll, we'll hit the mark. Um, I want to say that, that holiness is a complex idea, um, that it isn't something that's, that's, that's very simple and easy to define. And I wonder sometimes if our tension or our difficulty in understanding it is because you know, there might be tension between how we understand it in English as far as what we mean by holy and how the Bible frames it. And so just to start that out, I just want to take a look. Go ahead and go to the next. Oh, sorry, next one. There we go. So I want to take a look at how we frame it in English just to take a look because there's different ways in English that we approach it. So you had the notion of, of being worthy of devotion or, or, or as one is perfect in goodness and righteousness. Um, which is interesting because they overlap righteousness and holiness, which are different things. And I think sometimes in our English, we, we conflate the two. Um, and I think they're, they're different things. Um, and there's a relationship here between um, holiness and a sense of purity, right? That there's something worth, worth uh, being devoted to. Um, the second associates holiness with divine. And this to me is a little bit lazy because... It's saying, so if the Lord your God is holy, is they actually cite a scripture in that, but they're saying that um, the Lord is holy, therefore holiness is divine. Um, you know, and that, that can be problematic sometimes from a, I mean, it, it's particularly if you're looking at this passage, be holy, it's saying to be divine, that, that, that can be problematic. Um, but from this perspective, we tend to place holiness out of our reach because it's something that God has, right? Holiness is something that God is and we're not. And so this, something like this, it's hard for us to make sense of. Um, and then the third and fourth, um, they both have to do with being set apart, devoted to like a deity or a work of a deity or like venerated as if sacred. It's setting something apart um, for like a divine purpose. And um, this understanding has to do with what holiness does in a sense. So looking at our passage from the perspective of plain English, you know, some of these don't make sense in the sense that um, you know, the first one, without purity, without moral purity, no one will see the Lord. Well, does moral purity help us to live in peace? You know, how, how often do our commitments to moral purity put us in tension with our neighbors? You know, and, and, and their different commitments. So that might not be the best way to frame it. Um, make every effort to be divine, for without divinity, no one will see God. That, that's problematic. Um, and then the notion of... Uh, Make every effort to be set apart for divine purposes, for without being set apart for divine purposes, no one will see God. And that one sounds promising. We'll tuck that away. Um, another limitation that Jay had when we had our uh, Wednesday night Bible studies was that we wanted to try to stick in the passage. Like, we wanted to say we were going through an epistle, we wanted to treat it as if we're the ones who received that epistle and not necessarily jump to other parts of Scripture, um, that we're just reading this. Um, now, something like Hebrews... You know, that's impossible because it references the Old Testament so much. So if it's part of the context, you have to go back. But you know, we can read Hebrews without necessarily referencing James or Revelation, right? It's just not part of the necessity for that. So what I want to do is um, take, keep that in mind, and I want to take a look at the way the writer of Hebrews frames holiness in a few different passages. And he references the Holy Spirit a lot, and we're not going to directly deal with that because that's actually almost, we don't have, we have the name for the Father and the Son the Holy Spirit is the name for that third person of the Trinity, but it's, you know, it's, we'll, we'll deal with that in a bit. But I want to take a look at two passages in particular that talk about holy and holiness. Um, and the first one is going to be Hebrews 7. Um, go to the next one. Perfect. Okay. And 
Hebrews 7 was when the writer of Hebrews was talking about Jesus as a priest in the order of Melchizedek. Um, and he was making the case, um, of course, arguing from the lesser to the greater that if the priest is X, then Jesus is more X, right? Uh, so in the passage, uh, it goes through and talks about that. I'm going to start in 25. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he's always lived to intercede for them. Such a high priest truly meets our needs, one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. So you have this notion of Jesus as priest being set apart from sinners, being holy, blameless, pure. Um, and of course, that was part of what the priests did as well. You know, part of what the priest did was be set apart from sinners to, to do what they did. Um, they were set apart with other priests. Um, another, and I'll tuck that aside, I'll take a look at Hebrews 9. Um, and we talked about the holy place and the most holy place. And Jay went through that and what the kind of purposes of those things are. But in a similar way, I want to say that they're set apart, right? The most holy place is set apart from the holy place. And the holy place is set apart from the outer courts, which are set apart. You know, the, there's this like circle of being set apart. Um, and so, again, you have this notion of, 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 of purity, in a sense, um, and, and being set apart from people. So you have these spaces that are set apart, and you have these people, priests, who are set apart. And in my history, in this, the, 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 I, it wasn't necessarily the churches I heard. Maybe, it may have been entirely what I heard, but when, we, when I would hear holiness preached about, we typically would stop there in the sense that holiness was about being set apart from, right? That, that uh, we were set apart from the world to represent God's goodness and righteousness and purity. Um, and I think we miss something when we focus only on the notion of being set apart. Um, we can miss the notion that the priests in the temple were holy in that they were set apart for a purpose, the reasons for being set apart was for a purpose. And you know, the priests were set apart for the purpose of serving others, of offering their sacrifices for them, of serving as mediator between the sinner and God. That was the way that their worship was, was constructed, was set up. They performed the Hebrew ceremonies and rituals that were part of the process of being reconciled to God. Um, the most holy place and the holy place were set apart as spaces in which to perform these ceremonies and rituals, and they facilitated that process of reconciliation. Um, and here's what I want to draw from this. I want to suggest that when it comes to holiness, someone or something cannot be set apart from without simultaneously being set apart for. Okay, so that from a biblical perspective, uh, nothing is set apart for the sake of being set apart. Nothing is set apart just so it's different. It's set apart to serve a purpose. Um, everything that God sets apart, everything that God makes holy, God sets apart and makes holy for a purpose. Goodness and purity are for a purpose. So I want to read the passage again. Do I have it for the next screen? Good. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Go to the next one. I want to try to rephrase it with what we've said. Make every effort to be set apart. Oh, I'm sorry. This is kind of reading it through that that third way that we were looking at it before in light of what we just kind of talked about. So make every effort to be set apart for God's purposes. Because if you're not set apart for God's purposes, how will you see God? I think that's a fair reading of, of what, the pers what the writer of Hebrews is saying there. Um, this, of course, is both something that God does in us and for us, but it's also something that we do as well. We agree to be set apart for God's purposes when we come to faith. When we come to salvation and we recognize that we are created by God and for God, um, we are those who are, if, if we're going to be who God created us to be, then we have to begin to conform our hearts and practices to reveal that love of God and, and in obedience to the practices that are consistent with love. And, and that's part of that process of being conformed to the image of Christ. Um, and so I uh, wanted to kind of start there and then kind of bring the rest of the passage into focus. Um, I want to ask the question that if we are being set apart for God's purposes, what are God's purposes here? What are God's purposes here in this passage? Um, 
And there, you know, if you look at Scripture, you know, we, there are several purposes that we could say that we are set apart for. I want to take a look at what this passage says specifically about some purposes, of a purpose here. And I want to dive um, a little bit deeper into the notion of holiness to tease this out. And um, in order to do that, I want to dive into some Trinitarian theology, um, which is part of the reason why we sang that song. And uh, I don't know if you know who Tip O'Neill was. He was a speaker of the House in the 80s. And he coined the phrase that, um, politically speaking, Social Security was the third rail of American politics, that it has the power to power things. And if you treat it poorly, it has the power to like electrocute the person who plays with it. Um, I think that Trinitarian theology is the third rail <laughs> of, uh, of, of Christian theology just because it's so hard to deal with. Um, it is so, there are a lot of folks who have gone um, off the edge of, of what's, what the Bible tells us about the Trinity in the history of the church. And so it's, hopefully, I, I want to use it to help understand this. Um, and hopefully I, I, I don't mistreat it. But, um, you know, I had... Uh, it's funny, though, because we rarely, we rarely look at it as a resource for living. I had a, a professor once who said, if we can't preach the Trinity, what good is it? In the sense that it's, it's part of what we believe. When we say we believe in God, we're saying we believe in a triune God. That, that's the God that we believe in. Um, and so there has to be stuff there for us to, to draw on. I, th I, think, I think part of the reason that we don't do it also is the fact that there's no scripture in the Bible that says God is triune. There's no but that says God is Trinity. You know, you have in the Old Testament Deuteronomy saying the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then you have Jesus in the New Testament saying, I and the Father are one. And people going, what? How do we? And, and then that's even before the gift of the Holy Spirit in, in Acts. And so we have this re revealing of God as, as triune over the course of the Bible. And really, the creeds are a, an attempt to kind of make sense of that, kind of make sense of, of, of this, this triunity of God. So, um, so I want to point out that I'm trying to use a complex concept in the Trinity to explain another complex concept of holiness. So, so start your prayers for me now. Um, yes, yeah, so, uh, so we believe God is one, but that God's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, the Nicene Creed says that we believe that Jesus is the same substance of God. Right? That's how we kind of frame it, and the Holy Spirit as well. That they're all the same, but there's something there that's Father, Son, and Spirit. And that's who God is. Um, and I want to suggest that part of this means that God in himself, or, or God self, however you, God self sounds weird, but himself, you know, God isn't necessarily male. But um, I want to suggest that part of this means that God is community in himself. That there's a community of, within the Godhead. Um, and to put it simply, but, and briefly, but not too simply, um, God is love, right? So the Father loves the Son. The Son loves the Father and the Spirit. The Spirit of, there's this community of love within, within the Trinity. Um, a classic way of framing it, one of the classic ways that uh, folks, you know, from the early church have framed it is one God, three persons, four relations. Maybe that's too much math for Sunday morning. But, um, but that, that there are these relations within the Trinity of, of the, tr the, the, the persons loving each other. Um, so think about this. The Father sent the Son into the world trusting the son would obey the father while on earth. Have you ever thought about the father trusting and putting his faith in the son? The son comes to the world in obedience to the father and trusting and lives in faith and obedience while on earth. The spirit shines light on and draws people to the father through the son. It reveals the father's love for humanity, which is revealed through the son's obedient action. So you have all these things going on. This is, this is who God is. And why do I bring up these confusing notions? Um, for the reason that the fact that God is love and that God is community means that in God's nature, God has set himself apart to love the others in the Trinity. Okay? Um, that the Father loves the Son, the Son, all those things. Each member of the Trinity loves, trusts, gives themselves to the other members of the Trinity. So the very existence of God as triune means that God has set himself apart for the purpose of loving the others in the Trinity. And I want to suggest this is part of what is innate to God's holiness. When, when we say that, that holiness is a, is a sense of it, it's about being set apart. The holiness of God, part of what the holiness of God does is set himself apart to love the other members in the Trinity. 
Um, and take it a step further, as part of that love for the other, God has set himself apart to love his creation, particularly humanity. That God loves the other that exists outside of God. That once humanity disobeys God and mars the creation with sin, God bends the entirety of history around the redemption of humanity and the restoration of creation. This is the heart of God that beats, um, that he set himself apart for. He set himself apart for the redemption and the restoration of humanity. He set himself apart for, uh, to love that which is outside of God. Um, I want to suggest that this is a good part of what uh, holiness and our expression of holiness is about sharing in that purpose, right? So that if we um, believe that, uh, that God is about the redemption of humanity and the restoration of creation, then maybe we should be about that as well. Um, so, so at that point, that comes to look like us setting our, ourselves apart for those same purposes. So what does that mean for this passage? I want to suggest that the holiness the author writes about in the passage doesn't make sense unless it is viewed through the lens of service to the other. I want to suggest that the holiness in the passage is about setting ourselves apart for serving others. Further, it's about serving those within the church just as the triune God serves the others within the Trinity and serving those outside of the church just like God loves those outside of, of, of the Trinity. Um, so if we're endeavoring to live in peace with everyone, which this is asking us to do, then um, we're setting ourselves apart for loving them, for the purposes of their redemption and restoration. Then our life with peace with them isn't also about what benefits us, it's about what benefits them. Um, we're setting ourselves apart to love our neighbors and our communities outside the church. Um, and this also, just on a side note, you know, if we are in conflict with those communities for some reason, it means that we're choosing to do so, uh, to love and serve them using peaceful and loving means. Um, that, that's part of what it means to, to love them. Um, and if we move to verse 15, the, see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God. Um, I want to stop it there because we'll come back to the rest of it. Um, it means that I want to suggest that there's a part of our commitment to set ourselves apart to love our brothers and sisters in the church um, within our communities of faith. Um, you know, we've seen I, I, in a couple of the passages, and even with this one, that the, um, the writer of Hebrews believes that there's some dire consequences for, um, for those who leave the faith, for those who fall away from the faith. So part of our love for others in the community is to commit ourselves to help carry each other, you know, even in times of doubt, even in times of trouble, and difficulty, just kind of what you saw last week, the whole thing with viewing that as, um, as discipline and stuff. You know, where's a commitment to love and carry each other through those, those, those difficult times. Um, John Chrysostom, who lived in the late fourth century, I, I like to select this quote when I saw it. Go ahead. Um, talking about this passage in particular, this is part of his, his sermon on it. He says, if they were, which is kind of cool, we're looking at a sermon from a guy who did a sermon 1,600 years ago. Um, as if they were traveling together on some long journey in a large company, he says, take heed that no one be left behind. I do not seek this only that you should arrive yourselves, but also that you should look diligently after the others. No one who fails to obtain the grace of God, uh, that no one fails. Do not tell me it is only one that perishes, even for one Christ died. Have you no care for him for who Christ died? Um, um, so so you know, there's this notion of us loving and caring for each other, for the others in this room. That's part of our holiness. That's part of our expression of holiness. I think what you see in this passage. Um, and then the, the passage gets, <laughs> I set all this difficult stuff up to kind of explain that, but then the passage gets to the difficult part. And it goes on in the end of 15 and says, um, actually, go back. So, yeah, uh, yeah, 15. See to it uh, that no bitter root grows up and cause trouble and defile many. See to it that no one is sexually immoral or godless like Esau, who for a single meal um, sold his inheritance rights to the old, as the oldest son. And we'll stop there for a second. This whole story here, um, what, the, the, what the writer does here is he flips from saying what you should do to what you should not do. So do this, don't do this. Um, see to it that people avoid immorality and, and Esau's godlessness. 
Um, and I want to suggest that these represent a self-centeredness that's the opposite of the holiness of setting oneself apart for service of the neighbor. Um, if you guys don't know the story, Genesis 25 is where the first part of this takes place, um, verse 16. So basically the story goes like this. Esau is hungry, and Jacob had some stew. And he, he, Jacob said, I will sell you the stew. And Esau said, how much? And Jacob said, your birthright. And Esau said, I'm not using it. Um, and which I, it's, I, oh, it's, I got, oh, oh, it, the, there's a scene from Oh Brother, Where Art Now, which I can use in my mind, that's one other thing. Um, I'm not using it. Uh, and so he sells it to him. Um, and, and Jacob gets um, Esau's birthright as firstborn. And, uh, and you know, he sold his birthright. And what's interesting is that the second part here, that's verse 16. That's the condensation of that story in 16. 17 is a different story. 17 is Genesis 27. And basically, that is the story where um, Isaac, who was not able to see at this point, he was very close to death, who, um, had told Esau that he would give him his blessing if he would kill some game and make him some stew. We have stew again. Stew is very important. Um, and so he goes out to do that. Jacob's mother, Rebecca, actually both of their mothers, they're twins, um, hears this and tells Jacob, you go do this and do it quickly before him and you can get his blessing. And so he goes out, kills the game, makes stew. They put goat uh, skins on his arms because Esau was hairy. There's something kind of comical about this too. Um, and he goes in and tells him he's Esau and he gives him the blessing. And, and Isaac can't give the blessing to Esau then. And I, you know, Esau is very upset about this. Um, and so there is a lot between the end of 15 and 17. There's a ton in this small space that I want to kind of unpack because I think it's important. And I think it's important also to the other parts of um, Hebrews where it really deals with the notion of the warnings about falling away. And the end of 15, see that no bitter root grows up among you to cause trouble and defile many. That's actually a reference to a verse in Deuteronomy 29. Go to the next one more. There we go. And so you have this whole thing in 29 where, so <laughs> getting all your stories in the Old Testament today. In Deuteronomy 29, they are about to enter the promised land. And Moses is standing up and giving these blessings and curses. And he gives this warning. You yourselves know how we lived in Egypt and how we passed through the countries on the way here. You saw among them that the detestable images and idols of wood and stone of silver and gold. Make sure there is no man or woman, clan or tribe among you whose heart turns away from the Lord. Um, make sure there is no root among you that produces such bitter poison. And then he goes on for a bit and says, this isn't an if, it's a when. You are going to fall away. You are going to turn away. And he says, all the nations will ask, why has the Lord done this to the land? Why this fierce burning anger? And it's because this people abandoned their covenant with the Lord, uh, the God of their ancestors. Um, and and so, um, you know, why this transition from that reference to Esau's story? So this is something the writer's doing. He's going from that reference to the story of Esau. And so a commentator, Amy Peeler, I was reading, suggests that this command, this imperative, brings Esau to mind to the writer, right? See to it, these no, no bitter root grows up among you. And Esau was pretty bitter after having his... Um, blessings stolen by Jacob. And uh, in fact, it's, Genesis twenty-seven forty-one says that he really bore a grudge against his brother for a long time. Um, but what's interesting is that just in the previous chapter, in Hebrews 11, when we go through the, the halls of, of faith or whatever, the, the, the hall of faith is what, we, what, what folks call it, that the, the writer of Hebrews had just said, by faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. So there's a sense in which Esau did receive a blessing. It wasn't the blessing that he wanted, that he had, that Jacob had set aside for him, but Jacob created another blessing for him. It was, it was an altered blessing. It was changed. Uh, but it, it could be argued that the author of Hebrews, and I think he's doing this, uh, is saying that in Esau's initial act of carelessness, as it comes to his birthright, uh, 
gave Jacob license to, to, to possess his blessing as well. That Esau's careless act eventually led to bitterness between brother and so, to, to, between J Jacob and him. And that Esau realizes that, I'm sorry, the author of Hebrew, Hebrews realizes that one who is not serious about holding fast and setting themselves apart for God's purposes, uh, one who disregards the blessing of being adopted as a child will cause serious contention in, in, in the gathering of believers. Um, and the one who could you know, lead to um, a lot of conflict within the group. And I think there's something there to that. I think there's something there with that. Um, in addition, um, the author of Hebrews can find a parallel between Esau selling his birthright for a single meal and those who reject or turn away from the inheritance in Christ for comfort of the world. Um, so Esau's act is grave because it can't be undone. He can't get his birthright back. In fact, he never even asked for it back. Um, the Genesis says that he, he despised his birthright. Um, and he never got that initial blessing. That can't be undone. But the context of Deuteronomy 29 and, and Genesis 25 and 20 to 27 is important here because even though, like with Israel, they ended up you know, being taken away by Babylon, this is really reference to, to this punishment for idolatry and stuff, that, that can't be undone. But the story didn't end in destruction. Um, it may have, ended, may have started with punishment, but it didn't end with destruction. It didn't have the final word. In chapter 30, you can skip to it. I'm not going to read it because we're out of time. Um, uh, you can leave it there. It's fine. Get back one. Okay. <laughs> um, when you get to, to, to Deuteronomy 30, um, Moses proclaims the people that all the blessings and curses have fallen upon them, um, and they return to the Lord with their whole heart. God will restore them and take them back as God's people. So with God, I want to suggest that restoration is always possible. Um, even with Esau, um, he says that he'll always be subject to his brother, but eventually you shall break the yoke from your neck, his yoke from your neck. Thus Esau was punished and his life was altered, but he was not excluded from God's blessings forever. So overall, I want to suggest that the writer of Hebrews is connecting the selfishness of Esau's sale of the birthright to his loss of his father's blessing, even, if, even though it was through Jacob's deception. Um, however, even though we cannot change what has been done, he couldn't change what had been done. He was not forever excluded from the blessings of a relationship with God. And when it comes down to it, I want to suggest that the author of Hebrews is emphasizing the importance within this context of loving and serving the other. If he had taken his birthright seriously, if he had loved and served his family, th this would not have happened. So, so that's a lot. Um, so I want to do a, lot, a few practical implications here because we're at the end. Um, one, holiness, I want, I want you to think of holiness about purpose. When you hear holiness, I want you to think purpose. What am I being set apart for? It is going to involve being set apart from, but why am I being set apart? What am I being set apart for? To what end? Um, two, part of our being set apart is to love our neighbor, um, to love each other, to love uh, those within the church. As those made in the image of God, who loves both inside and outside of himself, we are to love. Um, this is a love that seeks to be part of the of, of our neighbor's redemptions and creation's restoration. And three, there can be spiritual and social consequences related to falling short of the grace of God. And those can't be changed. It's just part of it. But there's never, they never permanently separate us from the love of God and from the grace of God. And I will leave it there. So let me, let's, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for your grace. Father, help us to be holy. Help us to be set apart for your purposes. Help us to participate in being set apart for what you're doing in the world. And may your spirit continue to always guide us into your truth. In your Christ's name we pray. Amen.